Hi, everybody. I'm so happy we're here together. It's a little different than the usual. Uh, it's in the evening now, and uh, we have a special speaker that I invited to join with us today, and it's Nahama Dina Zwiebel, and she's on the line. I had contacted her because we have done many for bring-ins before on behalf of making a sincere effort to really open the gates of heaven above to bring like unbelievable <laughs> Yeshua's and we have witnessed many miracles and right now just this week uh, two cases came my way where mothers were crying about their children being taken away from them whether it was actually both by court situations that were really not normal like it's just really unreal. So on their behalf, um, we're going to all pray together, give sucka, and <coughs> go together and learn. And uh, please, God, we will hear more miracles. So without further ado, thank you, Nechama Dima Zwiebo, for joining us and uh, doing this with us. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. I just want to make sure that my regular attendees of the of the conferences that I usually speak uh, speak on are joining. So I was just wanting yes. to double check that um, you had merged in the other number, please. I called that number and I merged it. Let's see if it works. Nechamadina, I'm on. I do hear both of you. Oh, yeah. Oh, perfect. Baruch Hashem. Okay, thank you. Okay. So welcome. Um, tonight, as we know, is a very auspicious time to be holding any sort of gathering and for bringing because it is the eve of the 10th of Teves. The, um, it's, we call it Asar Teves, and um, it's a very, very important time for us to unite together um, in a show of solidarity <coughs> because this is what is going to help us have our reunification with God's third temple, with our temple, third temple, um, the Beis HaMikdash, speedily. So in honor of trying to do this and hastening the process of every single person having their personal redemption to lead to the global redemption, we wanted to learn something very special tonight called Hey Chaltzu. It's a mimer. It's a discourse that was given um, out as um, from the hands of the Rebbe before um, we had the first time when the Rebbe um, fell by the Ayal, by the, by the grave of his father-in-law. Um, at that time, there were many things that we were being given and with a lot of frequency. And one of them, one of the last things that we received um, was this mimer, was this discourse called Hechaltu. The, the basic topic of Hechaltu is the, the possibility of strengthening our unconditional love towards each other. And the Rebbe goes through it piece by piece, showing us how to get there and exposing to us what might stop us from achieving complete unity and complete unconditional love towards every fellow Jew. Before we start learning this, we usually give tzedakah and we say, great is charity, great is tzedakah that hastens the redemption, the personal redemption and the global redemption. I want to invite anybody who has any background noise to please press six star or six plane and mute yourself so that you can, um, so the noise does not interfere. Thank you. And then the next thing that we usually do is we actually sing a niggin. So I'm going to double check that that's okay, Miriam, because that there will be no male listeners on the phone. We can sing a niggin? Yes. Okay. So we're going to sing a niggin. And the niggin that I would like to sing is not a typical niggin. It has words. I will explain it what the words mean, and then we will sing it. And if you don't know the words, 
you can hum along, and if you don't know it, you can just listen. And the words are, Aidecha Hashem, Bilavavi, Vaachabeda, Simcha Laaylam. Hashem, I will thank you in my heart, and I will glorify, I will um, spread your glory of your name forever. And the next pasuk that is going to be part of this song is Kal Gayim Asher Asisa, all the nations that you have made, all the um, non-Jewish nations that you have made, Yavayu V'yishtachavu will come and will bow down. Kal Gayim Asher Asisa, Yavayu V'yishtachavu, L'fanecha Hashem, before you Hashem, V'yichavadu L'shmecha, and they will respect and honor your name. Ki gadal ata, because you are great. Ve'aisa niflais, and you do wonders. Ata elekim levadacha, you Hashem, only you Hashem. Those are the words. We will sing it. This is one of the the um, nigunim that the songs, the the words and the tunes. The words are from um, uh, Psalms, and I don't know exactly which one, but they were. It was made in in honor of one of the Rebbe's birthdays. And for a few years, for many years, every single year, the Rebbe's birthday to Hillim portion, the psalm portion, um, there would be chassidim, there would be um, um, the followers of the Rebbe would find um, a saying, a pasuk, a a phrase that would they felt would fit um, in connection with what the Rebbe was teaching at, at that time, etc., and they would bring it to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe would okay it, and then they would put it together to a tune, and then this would become the Rebbe's song for that year. So this is one of them, and it goes like this. Ida <laughs> He got a lot of the ice and me flies. I tell like him live a day. He got a lot of the ice and me flies. I tell like him live a day. Call him a Sarah, she saw Yava, you be a shackle of fun. We have a do the smack. Call him a Sarah, she saw Yava, you. So we feel it's very apropos because we're we're thanking Hashem for showing us the way that we can bring honor to Hashem's name, and we also know that through us being able to glorify Hashem's name, this will lead all the nations of the world to come and praise Hashem and and recognize Hashem's name, which is what Geula redemption is all about. And um, tonight, it's very appropriate for this because um, the opposite took place when it was the tenth of Teves. It was when the um, the Romans came very, very close and they surrounded the wall of the um, the temple, the Beis Hamikdash, and caused a tremendous discomfort for the Jews because. They came too close for comfort. So basically, they were doing the opposite of respect. So this is a very, um, this is what we call an etapcha. It's a turnaround. Um, it's the exact opposite of the dynamic that was experienced then. And and it is the, the forerunner of the dynamic of what we are expecting to be able to see even tonight. And now we're, we're going to learn. Um, in that merit, we're going to learn this mimer, this discourse called Hechaltsu. And through learning it, we are asking Hashem, or thanking Hashem, and in the schus of the Rebbe, Rabbi Nachem Schneerson, we are 
going to um, really draw down the final redemption um, in its entirety. We're going to actually see the base Hamikdash, see the temple, because the whole um, the whole uh, counter um, counter um, action to what happened is to have this tremendous unity and unconditional love towards each other because the opposite took place before the temple was taken away from us. Yes. Can you press the speaker on this? Is there a speaker? I'm sorry? This is being is there... recorded? Yes. It's, it is and recorded. Can you, make it can you make it louder? Show me where to make it louder or slower. Oh. What happened? Am I speaking too low? Hello? Yes, am I speaking too low? I could hear you, but maybe they can't. I can hear you. Okay. Okay, so... Everyone can push their buttons on mute so that the background noise will make it maybe easier for everyone to hear. Please. So I will make it mute. Adam, can you put it on mute? Okay. Mute. I can hear them. I don't want them to hear me. Okay, so we're going to start. We're going to do, we would like, we're not sure if we're going to be able to do this every single week. Maybe we're thinking we're going to try, um, but we're definitely going to start. And we're going to start like this. I'm going to read it. I'm going to read like um, a paragraph of it, and then I'm going to translate it. Um, we'll try it that way, or another option will be just to, to uh, explain it straight. Um, I'm going to see which one works better and what people like better, and we'll get a consensus, and then we'll decide which one we'll continue with. <laughs> And Hashem says to Mesha. Now this let me explain the setting of this. This is right before Mesha Rabbeinu, Moses, is about to pass away. He's about to go up to the mountain and be taken um with a very special type of death, um, reserved for Mesha Rabbeinu. Before he goes up to the mountain, Hashem says to him, take Nakama, take revenge on behalf of the Jews on what, revenge to whom? Re- revenge towards the Midianim, the Midianites. And after that, you will be gathered um, from your nation up on the mountain. And then Moshe Rabbeinu says, Hey, chaltu me'itachem. Arm yourselves from you. Choose from you. And it says that they they actually went and fought with Midian, and it was a revenge of Hashem in Midian. And each um, each tribe had a thousand people that were being chosen from their tribe to represent this war. So the Rebbe has a few questions. Vitzarech lahavin ma, well, it's not the, the, it's not the Rebbe, it's actually, um, I believe it's the Fizik Rebbe who's the one that writes this, I'm going to find out. But the, um, whoever is the one that's writing this mimer has these questions. Vitzarech lahavin ma shayechas milchamas midyam nistakos maisha. So the first question is, what is the correlation, what is the relationship between this war of Midian to Moshe Rabbeinu being um, removed from the nation, um, um, being able to go to a higher realm, in other words, not being in, amongst the living in this world. So, And that not only that, but it seems that that his passing away, his hisalkos, that's what we call it, was actually dependent first on him actually 
taking revenge against the Midianim, against the Midianites. And because it seems very clear, the correlation, first you do this, and then you'll be gathered from your nation. Umashma mizah base of arim. So from this is understood two things. Ha'echad, shemachemes midyan hayat sarach liyat aidei maisha dafka. First thing is that the war of midyan has to be dafka through maisha rabbeinu. V'lochei gam kishen niknes ha'alav misa. Kumash katsav kaidum lezeh v'pasha senchat. Alei el hari v'avarim v'chulu. V'nasafta v'chulu. Kasher nesav aron achicha. V'mikal maka in him to lay acha yucham tchila ben midyan. So we see that it was such a direct correlation and it has to be dafka through Moshe Rabbeinu. It has to be specifically through Moshe Rabbeinu, through Moses, that this war took place to the point that when he was told to go up to the mountain that and he would be gathered from, from the nation just like his brother had been gathered from the nation, that Hashem had to wait until he would first do this war with the Midianites and it was not left as a war till after he passed away all the other wars that were going to take place from that point and on were going to be after he passed away and it was going to be through Joshua the next leader, Joshua the next leader but this one particularly had to be done through Moshe Rabbeinu. This is very interesting. And ki haya tarikh ya sam khamad bin midyan ade mashe dafka so he could a national sava and he himself has to be the one not only did the nation have to, not only did the war have to take place dafka through Moshe Rabbeinu specifically Moshe Rabbeinu but also that he would have to be the one to actually choose the men that would go into the war. The Alpi Pasha so if we look at it simply, um, until they actually went into the land of Israel, everything was done through Moshe Rabbeinu. Everything was done through Moses, our leader. And just like the war with Sichon, there was a great big, a really, Sichon and Og were two big giants, and they were very fearsome giants, and Moshe Rabbeinu, actually went and um, killed them. He was actually able to overpower them. And then the land was divided, um, the beginning part of the land that was divided, that was done through Moses, through Moses as well, through Moshe Rabbeinu V'lachain, Kama Mechama B'midyan Hayal Dei Moshe, and therefore this war also had to be done through Moshe Rabbeinu because it was all prior to them going into the land. So if you look at it simply, why are we asking this question? Because it looks like everything that was done before they left the the desert, before they went into the land itself, was done through Moshe Rabbeinu, was done through Moses. So this would be just one of those things. Why is this such a question that why Moshe Rabbeinu had to do it and why it wasn't left to the, as the other wars? So, Amna, mi Masha Kasev, Nekayim v'chulu achar te'asef, Masha Masha yesh kepeida b'zeh, shetia mochama b'chayev dafka. But it seems like there's something extra here. It seems like there's like a resentment that's going on here. That Dafka, it has to be, specifically it has to be um, in his life. Ah, now we're learning something new. It's understood that through this war, his completion of the root of his soul would be completed. So it's not just that he would be their leader and fight the war. No. It seems like it's dependent and it's connected and it's a completion of his root of his soul to be able to to do this war. So now we're learning something. One second. Why are we saying that? Because when a person passes away this is the completion of the elevation of that person in this world. That means when a person passes away, the day when they pass away, that means the culmination of their life's work and their life's purpose takes place at that time. So the fact that he had to do this last act before he passed away, it meant 
that this act was connected and was the completion of Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our leader, Moses, the Moshe of the generation, that his entire purpose of his being our leader and his entire life purpose was culminating and connected to this particular act of having the war with the Midianites. So it's much more than just, okay, you're a leader and you need to take care of this before you pass away. No, it is directly, it is permeated and directly connected and bonded and united with his essence of who he is, of his root, of his soul, and it's bonded with the essence of him as his purpose in this world. So let's understand what does that mean. As we said, that when a person passes away, that's when the completion of his work takes place, and his highest elevation takes place. So here it's saying that we see right here that it's a very strong correlation, and it's uh, only when you're going to do this, then after that you will be able to be gathered from um, from your nation. As we say, and, and it's repeating, that through this war could actually be completed the the uh, root of his soul in his avaida, in his service of Hashem, in his purpose in this world in, of, of his life. And it would go elevation after elevation. The calls that are chlahavin lamaya tuchali is a machama day mashadafka mahushan islam is masa days. So now we need to understand if this is so, why did it have to be this way? What did this war have to do with completion of the root of his soul? And how how did he achieve the highest elevation at the time of his passing away through doing this act of the revenge against the Midianites? So this is the first this is our first ice. This is our first paragraph that we learned today as a beginning. And um, I would like to talk a little bit more um, about what we can do in our power um, to hasten the redemption. And I would also like to, um, I would have you give Miriam feedback if you like the way we do the Hebrew than the English, or do you want me to just go straight to the English and have a different type of flow? Um, but in the meantime, we're not going to continue today unless um, unless there are people on the line that would like to hear more. We can continue learning. So the two options are we can continue learning now, which is another paragraph, or we can talk practically how we can hasten the personal redemption in our lives and the global redemption. <coughs> and I'm going to invite those on the line to give their feedback. Is there anybody who would like to um, offer feedback? Hi. Or should I make it? It's yes. Devora, it's Devora. Hi. I would love to, uh, you know, um, hear about how to reach our personal redemption. However, I, am, I have a little bit of difficulty putting the phone um, on mute so where you wouldn't be able to hear me after, you know, after this. Um, because, and there's a lot of noise here in the background. I, I don't know how to put the phone on mute. You can press I Sorry, what is that? Please press six. Oh, press okay, okay. So I'm going to press six can, now. I guess we can um, maybe do the overall point that I was going to discuss now, and then more get into the practical after I just that might flow better. Sounds sounds good to me. Miriam, hi, hi, hi Miriam, hi. Hi, my dear, I'm so happy hi. to be on. And who is the other teacher? She 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 also sounds lovely. Nachama Dina Dweebo. Beautiful. Hi, Nachama. Hello. Hi. Okay, I'm going to press six now. Thank you. Unless we should continue more with the Hebrew first. It's up to the audience. Or I would like to go further, but I'm not going to be the one next to decide. And I definitely would like always to continue with the Hebrew 
I feel it gives the extra kadusha when you okay, read. Okay, so let's do the Hebrew for um, we we had uh, dedicated till nine thirty for that, and then from nine thirty to ten the overall uh, with the finishing hopefully touch. Okay, uh, okay, so let's do the Hebrew then for another another okay. paragraph. Then. Okay. I think so too. Okay, okay, so let's continue. Okay, so. Um, now we're going to go into a little bit more understanding of the questions that we asked. The gam tarach lahavin be'etam inyan hamacham as the midyan, the ikar hakavana baze hayalim kaim nikmas bnei yisrael mi hamidyanim loy bichtei la reshes as arsam. Now we also need to understand what is the essence of the the actual war of midyan. You see, when they were going to be going into the land of Israel and they were going to be conquering the land. That was the reason of all their wars. They were going to be conquering land and inheriting the land in order to be able to live there. Yet here, that is not the case. The war that's going to be taking place with the Midianites, they're not taking their land. And it's actually specifically to have, it's a, it's a vengeful war. It's to do, it's Nakama against them. And it's the vengeance of the Jews against the Midianites. So let's understand more. What, why and what is that? What, what, the, obviously, this war is a very different war than the rest of the wars that they were going to be fighting after this. And this is all going to start making sense about each, each, as we go through each detail of this war, it's all going to make sense why this war is so significant before Moshe Rabbeinu is um, gathered from his nation. So let's continue. This war is not in order to be able to inherit their land. As it, as we see from the Taira, from from the from the actual scripture, they did not inherit that land. They did not inherit the land of Midian, the Midianites. Even there were two and a half tribes that actually lived on the other side of the Jordan River, and they only inherited the land of Sichon and Og. Remember we said those two giants? They inherited their land. Okay, this is a footnote. So we're going to put the footnote aside. Um, because it has to do all about the, the words of Rambam according to Parshas Balak, etc., etc., with Midian. Okay. So now let's let's go back. And it's found that in general the inheritance of the land of Sichan included also the land of Midian. So they didn't have to fight to inherit it because they already had inherited it through Sichan and Ugh, through through fighting these two giants. And according to this, we need to understand, or we need to say that the completion of the war of Sichan, remember Sichan and Og were the two giants, was not even completed itself until they actually fought with the kings of the Midian, Midianite kings. I'm sorry. Hanavishka just joined. Okay, welcome. Um, so it's not it's not understood that from the psukim that this was the reason why from the scripture that this was the reason why they were fighting this war. So let's go um, continue. So the main intention of having this war, the Midian, was for revenge. We need to understand this. So in the beginning of the Mimer, beginning of the discourse, we were learning the different words that are said in, in the in the Pasuk, in the scripture, explaining the whole story. And we see um a so to speak a contradiction, so to speak, something that looks the opposite. When Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, you need to go and do this war because it's going to be a vengeance on behalf of the Jews. It's the vengeance of the Jews. 
And then when Moshe Rabbeinu gives over the instructions to the Jews, he says, we need to fight this war, and you need to fight this war, to have a vengeance for Hashem, specifically the name of Hashem, Havaya. It's very significant that I'm using this word because we're going to see later how it's specifically the name of Havaya that's being used for the vengeance. It's the vengeance of the name Havaya, and Havaya, we're going to explain more what that name of Hashem and its significance means. And it is. Okay. So here we see a discrepancy, so to speak. We see Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu one thing, and Moshe Rabbeinu then goes in and tells the Jews another thing. They both are talking about each other, so to speak. So Hashem is talking about the Jews, and, and, the Jew, and Moshe Rabbeinu talks about Hashem as far as the vengeance goes. But Sarah Lahavin Mao Inya Nikma Savaya. Hello, light us. So we need to understand why is it a vengeance for Hashem, specifically Havaya? Why? Didn't they do something wrong to the Jews? They did something really wrong to them. So it was a vengeance for the Jews. They were their enemies. They did some very, very nasty, not good things to the Jews. That's why. It would make sense that the Jews had to have a vengeance on them. But why is it a vengeance for Hashem? And how does that, how does it relate to the name of Havaya specifically? Why is it a vengeance of Havaya? What's the name of Havaya have to do with it as well? And if it's because um, the, the part of Hashem is with him, uh, that part of Hashem is his nation. As it says, Yisrenu ki and enai, um, we are the apple of Hashem's eye. And therefore, whoever touches them, whoever touches the apple of, of, of Hashem's eye is as if he touches Hashem himself. That would make sense. Like, in other words, if somebody went and challenged or hurt um, our dear child, they're starting up with a parent because they're, they are going to where they don't belong. So automatically, the the vengeance of the Yidin is the vengeance of Hashem. Because as soon as the Jews are avenged, so obviously, um, automatically, Hashem is avenged. This is, this is actually true. This is actually true. But the fact that um, this detail that it's lost nikmas havaya because we're putting we're adding this detail that it's a vengeance of avaya um, on midyan, it's understood that there is a an extra correlation and a specific detail of the name havaya. What is it? It meaning that this Midyan, which is the Klipa, it's the opposite of Kedusha, is the opposite, and it opposes completely, specifically the name of Havaya. It, it, it opposes Hashem, but specifically the name of Hashem as Havaya. Why? Well, we're going to understand more. Ubema. What did Midian do? They caused the Jews to sin. This was their action. This was their spreading of their klipa. They touched. They caused a pagam. They caused a... Um, What's the word pagam? How do you describe that in English? Um, a give me a second to remember the exact word. Um, not a wound, a something that's not perfect. A blemish, a blemish. They cause a blemish in the name of Aya. The Alza Amarla says Nigmas Havaya Bemidyan. That's why it's a vengeance of Hashem specifically vengeance of Avaya on Midian, because it was a personal vengeance. What did they do? It doesn't say it here. I'm going to just give a quick background for those who might want to know more details so we understand what we're 
talking about. When Balak and Bilam, they were Bilam was the sorcerer, the one he was the the the, the prophet that from the nations, and Balak was the king who hired him because he wanted to destroy the nation of the Yidin Chas Shalom. And he tried to get him to curse them so that they would be become um, weak and then he would overtake them. Balak would overtake them. And when Bilam was unsuccessful and he ended up giving them beautiful blessings, as we know, it says that Bilam and Balak met. And it says, and I will tell you what to do. It seems that Bilam was telling Balak something to do. And then it says that Bilam went back to his home. Bilam is the prophet. He went back to his home. And the next part that we see in the Torah after that in the scripture, what is written? That Midian, the Midianite princesses went and seduced the tribes of the Jews. And specifically, the, the I don't remember which tribe it was. Um, I believe it was Shimon, if, I don't, if I'm not mistaken. And it was, um, they seduced the, the tribe. And there were a lot of um, Jewish men, great Jewish men. We're talking about righteous Jewish men who were falling for the seduction. And there was a lot of um, immorality going on, a lot of stuff that was not supposed to be taking place going on until there ended up becoming a plague. And then there was a Midianite princess that approached the head of the tribe of Shimon and the tribe of Shimon, the head of the tribe of Shimon decided that he was going to, he did it. He had the the right intentions, but his actions were not appropriate at that time that he was going to somehow help, um, so to speak, get Hashem to see that it wasn't so terrible what his tribe was doing so that the plague would stop. And then Pinchas, and at that point when they were, um, in a, they were in intimate relations at that moment. Moshe Rabbeinu did not remember what to do, and no one knew what to do. And Pinchas couldn't even ask him because if Pinchas would have asked him, that would have not been that he wouldn't have been able to give him the the correct answer, so to speak. He, he had to make a decision, and Pinchas went and slayed the two of them together while they were in the act. And it was it had to be at that moment because if it would have been afterwards, then it would have been considered murder, and if it would have been before, it would have been considered murder. But at that time, it was not considered murder because at that time they were dra- they were dragging Hashem down into the lowest of the deepest of the dirt because they were um, the one area where we actually drag Hashem down, which has been, was in the, was in Tanya the past few days, is when there's um, a, a, a prohibited relationship. Because whenever there is a male and female in a relationship, Hashem gets brought into that relationship whether he wants to or not. And bottom line is that it was at that moment that uh, Pinchas went and played them and he was afterwards um, given a tremendous amount of rewards. He became a, a priest, a high priest, and he was also, um, he turned, he was able, his, his uh, soul went, became the soul of Eliyahu Anavi, Elijah the prophet which we know all about Elijah the prophet. So the bottom line is that going back to how was this a personal vengeance for Havaya, for Hashem, we're going to explain what the name Havaya represents. But in general, it was a personal vengeance because Midianites were the, were the um, catalysts and they were the ones that caused Hashem himself to be dragged down into the opposite of holiness and therefore it was a personal vengeance for Hashem himself that the Midianites would have to be avenged. Okay. So now we're gonna go back to um the mimer. So what it says here in this discourse in this mimer and what did the Midianites do? They caused the Israel to sin. They caused the Jews to sin. And, and, okay, we said this that this was their action and this was their spreading of the way they took their the opposite of Kedusha and spread it. And they caused a blemish in the name of Hashem. And by this it's, it's, it's said to give it a personal vengeance 
for Hashem, for Avaya specifically, to avenge himself from them, um, you know, towards them, and to destroy them. And through that, the blemish would be corrected. We don't under, you know, seemingly we don't really understand this. It's not so understood. Why? What is the actual concept of the the opposition of Midian to the name of Avaya specifically? Why is it specifically Avaya? It's against Hashem. But why specifically Havaya? Why is that name? And it says, and, and we, as we we're saying the whole time, that these, these are the words that were said in the scripture, in the Torah, that it's Nikmas Havaya, it's the vengeance of Havaya. So seemingly, what is possible to be a blemish in the name Havaya is more than the seven nations it must be more than the seven nations. Now, the seven nations, each of the seven nations represents a different midara, um, a different negative character trait. So it means that this must be even more than all the seven midas, because if this is actually what is the vengeance against Hashem, against Havaya, then it must be it must encompass more than the seven negative traits. Shehem lumazeh the kedusha, because we know that e- that there are seven midas um, that we know, that we learn about uh, midas of kedusha, chesed, gevura, tiferes, nefesh, pay, yisaid, malchus. Um, actually, if anybody would like to come on to um, to learn about more that, about that, we actually have a call that we do on Tuesday night. Um, you can call in. I'll, I will give the number at the end of this call if you want to call in on Tuesday nights at 8.30 to 9.30. Um, we learn about these midas. We go through them one step at a time and understand how to purify and rectify them um, as a in the memory of a very special woman named Miriam Basmashiakai. Anyway, so these, so those are the seven midas. Those are the seven character traits that are positive and they are holy. And then... Every time Hashem created anything holy in this world, He created an opposing, non-holy entity so that we would have a true choice because true choice only comes when you have two equal things. So there's also a non-holy seven character traits and each one of them are represented by a different nation. So it must be that if none of the nations are, if the vengeance of the nations are not um, considered um, vengeance against uh, vengeance of Havaya of Hashem, then it must be that the vengeance that the vengeance of Midian must be more than the vengeance of each of these seven nations. Aval Midian ena umais. The Midian is not generally of the seven nations that have are, that are corresponding to the seven negative traits. Va'ay um, aklal at all. So now, before we answer that question, what is it that Midian specifically opposing Havaya, the name Havaya, we have another question. And the question is, what is it, why is it said, um, choose from you? And, and I'm, I'm sorry, not not choose from you. I'm sorry. Arm from you. Arm from you. Hayatirchli laimar yechalsu. It should have said, you should um, that all of you, every one of you, should arm yourself. The hechalsu mashma kuchan. When you say hechalsu, hechalsu means all of you go and arm yourself. But really, it wasn't everyone who armed themselves. It was only a portion of each of the tribes. So it should have said, Yechaltu, meaning some of you will, they will. In other words, this amount of people will arm themselves. But here it says, Yechaltu, it includes the whole entire army. It includes the entire, the whole entire Jewish nation. So the grammar is not correct here, so to speak. And if you're saying, Okay, so if you, if it means if you're choosing only a certain amount of people, so you're saying yechaltu, 
But meanwhile, it's Heichaltsu, and Heichaltsu, the, the grammar would mean that everyone needs to come. But really, the reality was that only a thousand of each of the tribe came. And if that's the case, then it wouldn't say Me'itachem, because Shalai Hachu Kulam Oh, no, I'm sorry, because it says Me'itachem. So, so Me'itachem, the grammar is right. Me'itachem is from you. Arm, so now let's, okay, I'm going to read you the words again, and I'm going to translate it as if it's how it sounds, and you'll understand why the grammar is not correct. Heichaltu me'itachem in translation means arm yourself from you. All of you arm yourself from you. That doesn't make sense. That, that grammar, that's not grammatically correct. It's either all of you arm yourself, period, or... Some of you from you should arm yourself. But the fact is that not everyone went to the to the war. So it does it, so the word hey is 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 grammatically incorrect because it's rock elef lamata. Only a thousand from each tribe went. As it says after that, the Zesha Amar, as it says, Meitachem Vilaikochem. It doesn't say kochem. It doesn't say heichaltu kochem. All of you arm yourselves. It says heichaltu meitachem. All, all, you should all arm yourselves from you. And again, that's not grammatically correct. So what it, it should have really said yeichaltu meitachem or heichaltu kochem. But the fact is that it says something that doesn't grammatically make sense. Im Cain. It should have said, as we said, it looks like we're talking about all of the Yidin, all the Jews coming, and we know that wasn't the case. They should arm themselves, and they should hasten to go to war, this war specifically, etc. And as it says afterwards, a thousand for a tribe, of all the tribes, why is it saying to all the tribes? In other words, it should be a thousand to all the tribes. What do you mean to all the tribes? If you're taking a thousand from a tribe, it should say, and a thousand men from all the tribes. So now we have a second grammatically incorrect sentence or phrase. So this is these are the questions that are coming up in the second paragraph, so to speak. Um, this is a big paragraph of the of this discourse, and our time is uh, getting very close to having the general idea of what we can share about tonight. Um, so I'm going to just quickly summarize what we learned, and we are going to let you know if we're going to continue every Wednesday for a half hour going through um, paragraph by paragraph so that we could learn the answers to these questions and understand how does this apply to us in our quest to bring a personal and global complete redemption. So this quick summary is as follows. Moses is ready to go up to the mountain and be gathered from his nation. Hashem says, wait, stop. I have a mission for you to do. This mission is extremely important. It's so important that until this mission is done, it is not going to be possible or allowed for you to go up to the mountain. This mission is for you to take a vengeance against the Midianites. And it needs to be a very strong vengeance against the Midianites to the point that they're going to be destroyed. And I want you to take a thousand people from each of the tribes and have them arm themselves and prepare themselves to be able to, to go as quickly as possible and decimate the army of the Midianites. And this is a personal vengeance. And Moshe Rabbeinu is told the words Heichaltsu, that it seems like everyone is supposed to be arming themselves and really it's only a thousand people. And and he's told Me'itachem, and that would only pertain if it was for some people. And then he's told Lechal Matais to all the tribes, and meanwhile it's supposed to be Mikal Matais because it's He's going to be choosing it from all the tribes. And it seems like it's such an important task that it has to do with his actual 
essence of who he is and his his soul roots. Why? Because at the end of a person's passing, that is when when a person passes away, that's the culmination of his life's purpose and work and everything that he ever um, toiled for. And more importantly, the whole reason why he came down to this world is culminated at the end of his passing. So it must mean that if this is contingent upon his being able to pass away, it must be connected to the completion of his root of his soul and the completion of his actual purpose of this of his um, service in this world, and he is the shepherd of the entire generation. So it's a very, very um, pivotal. Um, um, it's, it's it's very not only pivotal, but it's essential to the root of of his purpose in this world. And we need to understand why, and we're trying to understand why. And we have one other point that Hashem. When he tells Moshe Rabbeinu, he says it's a vengeance for the Jews. And when Moshe Rabbeinu tells the Jews, he says it's a vengeance for Hashem, and specifically he uses the name Havaya. And then as we see further, it seems like it's such a, so, um, so crucial and so important to Hashem himself that this vengeance takes place. And we, it, we would imagine that logically that would make sense because we're the apple of Hashem's eye, and being the apple of Hashem's eye, anyone who touches us causes a uh, blemish to a cause it, it, it is starting up with Hashem, so to speak. However, it seems like it's much more than that. It, we are learning that it's actually that they have caused a blemish to Hashem's name of Havaya, and therefore it's a personal vengeance. And we quickly understood why, because the Midianites were the ones that seduced the Jews to do an act that would draw Hashem down, draw Havaya down into the biggest muck of the opposite of of holiness, and therefore through that they cause the Jews to gra- to have grave sins, and a lot of um, not good things came out of it, um, and there were plagues, etc. And because of that, this is a personal vengeance of Hashem. So the questions that we still need to answer are, number one, what is so specific about the name Havaya, Hashem's name Havaya, that seems as the 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 klipa of the Midian, the, the, the opposite of holiness of Midianite, negate Havaya specifically. And if so, if it seems like if Midian is a klipa, if it's the opposite of Kedusha, then what about the seven nations who each represent one of the seven um, negative character traits, as we said, that whatever is in holiness, the op- there's an opposing non-holiness um, entity created as well. So it seems like there's that it's not one of the seven nations, and each one of the seven nations represents one of the characteristics. It seems like this is more or above these seven characteristics, and that it seems like that's, that it negates the name of Avai specifically. So we need to understand, number one, why are the words, why are the grammatical, um, why, is, why is the language grammatically incorrect? Number two, we want to understand why the name of Avaya specifically has needs that vengeance against Midianites and how specifically it's, it's such strong negation against the name Avaya. And number three, we want to understand how come this particular act is so pivotal, so crucial, and so essential to the completion of the purpose of Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our leader, before he passes away. And how does it complete his soul root of his soul? It, it, the, the root of his soul and, this, and, and the purpose of his entire being the shepherd of, the, of his generation. Okay. If there's any questions, feel free to um, ask. If not, then we will go on with the second part of the program with Miriam. Miriam, are you with us? Hi. Miriam, are you with us? Okay. So until Miriam joins us on the line, um, I will be happy to share a few very important things um, having to do with working towards our personal redemption and to our global redemption. And as soon as Miriam joins us, um, I will uh, finish off. Okay. So... We need to understand something very important. Um, what was the pivotal key? What was the role of the Jews um, in 
not being able to um, accomplish that the second temple was able to send strong. The main thing was that there was the lack of unconditional love. And actually, it was not about the unconditional love. Um, there are a few different opinions about what really took place. One of them was that Jews actually would look on the other Jews. They would they would they would look at them and say, "This person's not doing things according to the code of law. This person is doing something wrong." Um, and they would almost have like a vengeance, so to speak, like like um, not a vengeance, a zealousness for God, in a way though that cross boundaries with the other Jew, either by by um, judging them in their heart, even if they didn't say anything, um, not judging them favorably, um, or just um, thinking that they might be, quote, unquote, a little bit better than the other one. But let's not dwell so much on what it was that caused us not to have our second base on Mikdash, the second temple. Let's dwell and focus on what we can do to bring the third one. And this actually is connected to our personal redemption. Each of us have an area in our life where we want to feel stronger emotionally, mentally, spiritually, physically. And each of us have an area where it's that tunnel. And we constantly feel like we're going through the tunnel and we see the light and it's so far, but it's there. It's a glimmer. And as we come closer to it, we feel like we're going to get there any minute. And somehow the tunnel just keeps going and going and going and that glimmer of light just stays in the distance, that glimmer. It's there, but it's a glimmer, and it's in the distance. This is our personal exile. Any area in your life where you, where what I've just described, that's what you feel, this is your personal exile. This is where you are looking for what we call the personal redemption. How do we reach that point? That is a million dollar, maybe billion dollar question. I cannot tell you how exactly it's going to happen for you. I can share with you a couple of tools that have helped me be able to get closer where I see the light instead of just a glimmer. And there are times when I felt like I actually got out of the tunnel only to go into the next tunnel. But at the same time, um, it has been very helpful in um, allowing me to be able to really overcome some big obstacles in my life. And the key is to recognize that everything that we experience in this world is really all about us cultivating a deeper and closer relationship with Hashem, with God. Because do you know what global redemption is? And do you know what personal redemption is, which leads to global redemption? Personal redemption is having a relationship with God that is growing and pleasurable and loving and awe-inspiring at the same time. That is personal redemption. And global redemption is when the entire world will see that everything is God and God is everything. So when we have a situation that's going on that is really, really painful and challenging, that is considered our gaila, gola, G-O-L-A-H, or in Hebrew, gimel vav lamed hey. And the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe teaches us that in order for us to have our personal redemption, we have to bring one letter into this word, and that's the Aleph. And through putting the Aleph in there, it spells Geula. Now, I don't know, there are many people on the line, and I don't know who has gone through what level. So some people, this is basic elementary, and some people, this is something we've never heard. So I'm going to explain a little bit more, and everybody will be able to get something from this. And if you know this, it's okay to hear it again. Aleph into the Geula, which turns into Geula, Let's look at what the word, what the letter Aleph means, and what does that mean practically for us? 
Miriam, I'm only speaking because I wasn't sure if you were on. And if you are on, you're welcome to interrupt me, and we'll finish off. Okay. Aleph is the idea of a master. Aleph is the word alufai shal ilam. Aleph alufa alufai shal ilam, the master of the world. In other words, when we have an experience, we have a choice. And we have a challenge, we have a choice. And when we have that deep, dark tunnel, we have a choice. We can continue going through this tunnel by ourselves and trying every practical means to overcome it and look at it as part of our life, and that's life. Or we can say, the answer is, excuse me, one second, um, is there, can everyone hear us? Can he, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. I can hear it you. Seems, it seems like Miriam, this is very interesting. Miriam is on the line, and there are people that can hear her. And I cannot hear her. That is very interesting. Okay, I'm just going to finish with this thought, and then we'll I'll, we'll try to figure out how to... Miriam, I'm going to finish with this thought, and then I'll be quiet, and we'll see maybe if this is something that you can figure out. Okay, everything's Ashkacha Pratis. Okay, so in short, Alufa um, Shal Alam is the idea of the master. So we can say that we're not going to go through this tunnel by ourselves anymore. We're going to go through this with our master. We're going to ask Hashem, and we're going to actually thank Hashem for helping us navigate this challenge and then the next step we're going to do is by allowing Hashem to come and help us navigate our challenge then the Aleph becomes another word it's called A'alefcha Bina I will teach you A'alefcha comes from the word of I will teach you Bina understanding in other words by us recognizing that whatever we're experiencing is about having our relationship with Hashem brought closer we can say Hashem this is a challenge for me, and I know this is a challenge for me so that I can get closer to you and I can connect with you. I'm asking you to help me navigate this challenge, and I'm thanking you for helping me navigate this challenge. And through doing this, we can open ourselves up that Hashem will help us understand what the true solution on a practical level is. And then the third level will be Nifla ice, Pella. Pella is if you take the word Aleph and you turn it around, the letters are turned into Pella, which is wonders. And then we will be able to experience wonders in a natural form, meaning that within the the natural experiences, but it will be something that will be eye opening or it'll be something that will be miraculous as a natural miracle. That means even in my, it could even look like a coincidence. It could look like that day I went and I met this person, coincidence or coincidence, you know, Kasha Shalom. It's not coincidence. <clears throat> it's what we call Hashkacha Pratis. And it's a way of us being able to invite Hashem in. Hashem is with us. It's about us revealing Hashem in the situation. So again, we have a gola, we have a tunnel. That's our, that's our personal Gullus, it's our personal exile, and we have been trying to navigate this, and we say, Hashem, thank you, Hashem, for helping me navigate this, not only helping me navigate this, but um, showing me the solution, and I know this is because you love me and because you're trying to help me get closer to you, and this is our opportunity to get to know each other, and then through this, Hashem, God willing, our eyes can be opened, and then the practical solution can appear. If it's a health situation, then um, God willing, then all of a sudden we hear about a new doctor that we didn't hear about, or we get an appointment with a doctor that we've been trying to get hold of, or things fall into place in, in any way practically, and then this is how we start seeing wonders in our lives. Of course, we need to recognize that they're wonders, and the way to develop a relationship is to thank Hashem every single day for three things that we already have, what to be thankful for. And then to take a moment and thank Hashem for one thing that we have not yet had 
see materialize. It has to, it could be something very small, and through that we develop a relationship with Hashem because when Hashem responds to us, we see, oh, Hashem, you're really listening. This is really interesting. You really want to have a relationship with me. And this is just the beginning. Of course, there's, you know, more steps after that. But I will end off with this um, and and um, invite each of you to try this and, um, God willing, to be able to report your miracles to Miriam. Okay, Miriam, I didn't hear you before. Can we hear you now? Miriam Yerushalmi, can we hear you now? Miriam, you want to try to call in again? Are there people that hear you? Does anybody hear Miriam Yerushalmi? I don't hear her. I don't either, but maybe I have a suggestion. Maybe you should hang up and recall in because maybe there's some reason you're muting the other speakers. Sure. Okay. Because maybe that's seems, the problem. It seems like there's somebody, somebody, some, a, a friend of mine who's on can hear her, and I don't hear her. So I'm going okay, so to. We can I'm only hear you. Up. Okay, I'm going to hang up, and I'm going to call back in, and hopefully that will allow Miriam to speak. Okay, thanks. I think I'm also going to hang and call back in, and maybe that will help. Is anyone else here, Miriam, now? Since we're waiting, I'm wondering if the woman is on the line that we had learned Hechal to together recently that I spoke that she might share at the end of this. Is she on? Hello. Okay, do you hear me now? Is this Miriam? Yes. (laughs) Oh, wow. Baruch Hashem. I feel like it's so excited because I was trying to bless you like twice already, so now I'm going to bless you a third time, and it'll be even more b'rachava. I just want to bless you. That was amazing, unbelievable. May Hashem bless you because you are doing something out of this world. And I have to thank you personally that whenever I feel I need some extra, uh, an extra force to help me help other people, you're always, like, so available and, and, you know, accommodate my wishes to get together and learn and merge. So, bless you, really. Um, I, before I start sharing, I would like to just give you a little background information about why we're doing this, especially tonight. Well, yes, it's about to be a fast tomorrow, um, and hopefully this will definitely inspire us during the time of our fast to upgrade and and really bring more of that light into our life. And in doing so, have a kavana that um, this girl, and it's more than one little girl, but now I'm just going to focus on this one little girl. And I got permission from the mother. Her name is Galia. Um, Galia Sara Baschana Rivka. And um, she is actually um, a daughter of a converted now Jew, and the relatives didn't want her to be Jewish, so they're trying to take legal custody of this little girl from away from her real mom, and they tried all kinds of very interesting tactics, to say the least, Um, I don't want to say negativity, but, and have somewhat succeeded to a point, but we're now going to stop this. And um, we'll give extra staka, we'll do extra nigunim, we're doing extra learning. And in our fast, we're all going to pray for her complete uh, return to her real mother. Because right now, she's not with her mother. She's in a goyesha home. 
and she's trying to be, uh, she's been there now, um, you know, for a while, weeks, and she's just six years old, and she's really trying hard to do Torah and Mitzvah, and even though her non-Jewish biological grandma is very hostile toward her, uh, uh, her practicing Judaism, um, and she's crying because every time her mom calls, the grandma call, uh, hangs up the phone and makes me really want to cry. And I pray that uh, through our being here together, um, she will be returned to her mother and her father. She's gone. And this is not just the one case I heard this week, so it's like enough already. Ad Masai and Mashiach. Um, so uh, basically, right now, I just want to tell you that when I was learning Heichaltu, you know, over the years, again and again, and then like one time, I had a little, like an aha experience of what does Heichaltu mean yeah. to me. And I will share that with you from what I have, uh, you know, um, learned. Um, this is what Midian is about. Midian, you know, comes from the word uh, Madon, Mem Dalid Bav Nun, and that means strife and contention. This actually is a klipa. And as we were learning earlier, it is the source of all Klippas. That's why this name is the counter opposite of the source Hashem of all goodness. So by battling this Midian, we're basically battling the opposite of godliness at the level of the source of all negative traits. And what is this one trait that is the source of all other traits? Faceless hatred, which is this unity between the heart and the exact opposite of the side of holiness. And we have to understand a little background of this force. It didn't start at that war. It was way back in time when the... In the highest of realms of Tohu, all kinds of forces, Gvura, Chesed, Seferis, Netza, Chod, Yisod, <laughs> were like up there and not able to mingle. There was such a force between these energies that they kind of crashed into one another and then spilt as it were, and sh- in their state of being, you know, you know, like if you imagine two rams, you know, putting their two horns together, it could be so great, and if they were going so fast, the impact would be that both of them could just fall, and even maybe, you know, not survive. So the force of all these spiritual energies were so incapable of being included in one and the other that they bashed into the other, and they shattered into all the places here on earth. They fell. And so God says to the Jewish people, you, my dear, beloved child, you, I'm going to give you a task that could not be accomplished in Tohu. When you Get along with another person. When you have the capability, like a pregnant woman who expands her belly to make room for another, when you expand your wisdom, when you allow the Torah that you learn to make room for some other person who is the exact opposite of you in many respects, one person can be very chesedic, and the other person could be more like a Shammai type of Jew. Hillel has his view, and Shammai has his, but they respect one another. They make room for the other, even though they have opposite opinions. And it doesn't even make sense to one and the other. How can you think that way? <laughs> so when you expand your mind 
and say, <laughs> okay, they're different, maybe even shockingly different, but I'm not going to allow the differences to shatter our unity. We are one. We are one nation. And this is something we can accomplish that Tohu could not. The example given in Eichaltu is that <coughs> the whole purpose of this shattering and being spread out all around the world for us to gather the pieces together and have unity is as follows. Imagine a very, very, very like intellectual genius. And he's trying to explain to his child certain concepts. If he says what he knows <laughs> to that five-year-old boy, it'll blow them away. They will be like, what? what are you, oh, <laughs> can't get what you're saying. And it'll, it can kind of really confuse the child after a while. So what does the father do? He piecemeals it, he gives mushals, he tries to bring it at his level, and piece by piece by piece, maybe over, you know, 18 years or what have you, then finally the child can put all those pieces together and, aha, understand what the father knew and knows. God has all these energies. They're too powerful. If given directly, it just doesn't, it, it, it was just too much. So God says, I'm going to scatter all this information, all these sparks, all these energies, all this knowledge, all this everything in the world, putting it in different psyches of each yid. And by us then getting along with one another, one person and then another person and another person, then all of a sudden, more and more godliness resides within us. Now, what happens? Because God doesn't want to make it so simple for us. He gives us this yesaha. <laughs> he gives us this level of ego and yeshus. And all of a sudden, when one person meets the other, because this person has this tempting energy of the opposite force, all of a sudden there's like, I don't know why, but I can't tolerate this person. You ever had that happen to you? You like, you were so nice, you behaved so wonderfully, and you feel an energy that just, they just don't like you? And like, what did I say? Oh my gosh, maybe, I don't know, I, I have no clue. Trust me, they don't either, really. These are the type of people that have not refined their character traits. These are the type of people who have more yeshus. And their baseless hatred, okay, let's even call it unfriendliness or not accepting you or not making you feel like you're worth anything or they won't even turn your head to like acknowledge that you exist comes from Midian. It comes from this source of all the negative character traits coming from Jesus. I exist. And the mere fact that somebody else exists like like shakes them up. It, it, it's just like, wait a minute, if, if I exist, your mere existence is taking away from my existence. So, Heichal Su explains, they try to connect why they don't like them. Oh, see how she uh, doesn't know Allah or can you believe how she answered that in public to me? And they'll find some kind of pretext, maybe, and connect it. But really, everything comes from Midian. Everything comes from a baseless hatred. It's only the imaginative faculty that tries to associate one thing 
so then they can like you know even talk about their this uh, this weird person to their neighbor and say yeah look how she behaves and blah 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 and 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 then get other people going even maybe against that other person. So first of all, this brought me such peace of mind because. Forever, I were in situations, and I was like, I just don't know what I did here. And I understood now, and it gave me an ability to not let the heart. Uh, okay, so back to arming ourselves. Now that I um, let me just text her to try calling again. Mary, may I, may I add something in the meantime? Yeah. Or are you in the middle of a thought? Yeah, I'm just in the middle of a thought. Just this idea, okay. but please hold that thought too, or maybe write it down. So the idea is is that now I don't have to as easily get too enmeshed in it and too tempted to like uh either belittle myself because i i it's like why I guess I'm not good, I guess something's wrong with me or whatever, God forbid, and it'll help all of us rise above what's happening and realize this is my opportunity to do things that Tohu couldn't do when I understand. That this moment, when I rise above it, and I love that fellow Jew, I might not like what they just did, I might not um, understand, you know, and I have to work through not judging, but there are those clear cases (laughs) that is clear to everyone. But anyways, but the fact is, is I have a moment to undo what couldn't be done up in the higher world. When I take that moment and have Avas Yisrael, you know, we learn when uh, Alter Rebbe was asked by his Hasidim, very famous, it's in Hayom Yom, uh, you know, which is superior, void of love of Hashem or love of a fellow Jew? And Alter Rebbe replied, both love of Hashem and love of Israel are equally ingrained in every Jewish neshama, ruach, and nefesh. I love you says Hashem. And this the scripture actually explains explicitly that it follows that love of Israel is superior for you love whom your beloved loves. And it's interesting, just last night I was studying with my husband and my son regarding Yaakov Lomes. I'm just going to give one point of that. That if you see a person, and he's Yaakov, he has the 
you know, the Yud is in the foot, in the Ekev. It's like he's not outside behaving like a Yaakov, like a, a, a Yid. He's not nice. Don't think. That's the outside behavior. He's really so halicky, he's so holy, he's so pure. Understand. It looks like maybe he's nice, God forbid, like that he's not able to behave the way that one would expect of a, a, a yid who inherited all the spiritual qualities of a Yaakov. This is how we guard ourselves and arm ourselves. This is how we accomplish bringing the Geula that much quicker. Think about it. We need to expand our minds like a pregnant woman. So all of the Yidin can reside with oneness because every other yid is in our soul, and the Semach Tzedek, Derach Misosecha teaches us that all souls are within our soul. And they are part of us. But now, on the exterior level, we accept them. We love them. We try to be able to handle them, not with anger, not with impatience, not with, but just with compassion. But they're stuck at the moment when they're behaving a certain way. I give an example. that if some person, God forbid, was in some kind of crippling situation and the other was saved from it, and that person who has been, you know, in a wheelchair for a while and is crying and yelling, I'm cold, give me a, give me a blanket, ah, ah, and like they're really irritable because they're in pain and they can't go fetch the, the, the blanket by themselves and you're like, you have a choice. You can get really irritated after a while. Like, you know, I'm human. Wait, why are you talking to me like that? Or you can like say, oh my gosh, look at your state. Baruch Hashem, I'm not there. I have feet. I can walk. I'll understand you. I understand you're in pain. I won't take it personally. And I will bring you the blanket and warm you up with love, with compassion. And the most important thing is to realize how powerful that moment is when you have that acceptance. There's a passage that says in Tehillim, in righteousness, Oh, I'm sorry. In silence, righteousness do speak. And the question is asked, wait a minute, be silent or speak righteously? Which one is it? Well, it's like a sentence I'm trying to live with every day and let's all bless each other that we can live it together. You want to speak righteously? Please be silent first. Please think. Please try to take the moment to get away from your animal soul, your Yitzhahara, and their negative way of speaking. Oh, let me think. Let me take a deep breath. How am I going to solve this? What's the best way? Maybe I should just be silent, and that's also a form of speech. But definitely take the space and be silent before speaking. And if we just leave with that today as another accomplishment that we want to do to bring more harmony and peace in the world. I just pray for all of us that
that this information will be holy ammunition. This will be something to arm ourselves with so we can be the lamp lighters, that we can be the ones bringing Mashiach. So I want to take a moment and pray. Whoever needs the koifas that we pray together right now and we help each other reach that goal because every time we fix something in ourselves, we're fixing everybody. We're elevating every energy, every even goy around the world. Especially right now, that goy that snatched that girl, that Yiddish Maybelline. May it warm her heart, our learning together, our making this commitment. So let's take a deep breath and just do a little his bonanus. And with every breath you take, it's like you're breathing in all your learning. And with every breath you take out, you're really focusing your attention and how you want that learning to affect how you speak. Especially after someone has been not so pleasant. Maybe even a little challenging. Take a moment as you prepare this and beg Hashem, please let this meditation for your sake help me get to that next Duladic level. I want you to picture a scenario And you are succeeding like never before. Like it is out of this world, amazing success. You see so much light surrounding you. Your eyes are really intensely focused on the other person and what they're going through. You're listening They're seeing you really being there at the moment, fully concentrating on their needs. It's like your heart is expanding with more and more lovely, beautiful feelings of compassion and love. And even though you're seeing them in the the beginning one way, right now you see it's having its effect on them and they're really being affected by your light, by your energy. You feel armed, but armed with love. And that love spills over to them, and they begin to feel armed with love. It's just such a beautiful, beautiful vision. It's so beautiful. You have this vision, it's like the way it is. A hundred percent pure godliness. Take a moment. Say a silent prayer between you and Hashem. (coughs) 
and really now begin to see the wonders unfold. You are in a Geula moment. You armed yourself with Hashem and this knowledge of Hashem and you're seeing the wonders. And then let's collectively pray for this little girl. Let's all say a prayer now. Galia, Sarah, Bashana Rivka, our warmth, our love, our unity right now is keeping you so holy, so protected. God only knows the reason why you had to go through this. And we're going to have a for bringing and we're going to celebrate when you are going to be back with your mama. And whoever's ready, and they open their eyes, and you want to share, uh, I had invited someone. I don't know if she was able to stay this long or if she's on the line. We'll start with her first. She had wanted to share her experience of having learned Heikhalsu. But anyone who wants to share, go ahead. The line is open. (coughs) May I share something, even though I've spoken for a long time? I love you. For sure, my dear. I don't want to just take the whole the mic the whole time. Um, so I was waiting for someone else to share. Um, so I, that's why I was asking. In other words, if there's anyone else that wants to share, please go ahead. Unless I muted everyone. Hold on one second. I don't know if she muted because I hear both of you. I just don't know what to do now. I can't express myself and I can't even talk anyway. <laughs> okay, why don't you start? Muhammad and you both. Okay. Um, two things. Number one, Baruch Hashem, I had this class, uh to start teaching the Mimer of Hechaltu in Crown Heights, and we got through quite a few chapters, and then uh, we had to stop for summer break, and um, then so many different things took place, and the hostess wasn't able to host anymore. Um, So we were unable to continue. However, um, whoever shares knowledge, Hashem blesses them with their mind is a thousand times clearer, because chinuch, which is education, is like spiritual tzedakah, and when a person gives tzedakah, charity, they actually are blessed with their mind a thousand times clearer. So I'd like to share with you some insights about how I have worked on developing relationships with people that had been very challenging. I have a whole toolbox full of tools. And if one tool doesn't work, I use another. And sometimes I use them in combination. I used to be the type of person that was very sensitive I am a sensitive person, and whenever a person has a sensitive soul, 
They're sensitive to others. They also are very sensitive from others. And that was one of my traits that I had to work on, not taking things personally. So I started walking into, whenever I would like to join a crowd, instead of walking in and thinking, what do they think about me? I would think, what do I think about them? So I would walk in as an observer rather than as a quote-unquote self-conscious individual. However, I felt like that would lead to egotism or it would lead to uh, trying to make myself look more, you know, uh, higher, so to speak. And that's also not very helpful. Definitely not the spirit of a chalzit. So I had to think of something that would allow me to come in with an ease that would um, allow me to be myself and at the same time to allow the other person to feel comfortable around me as well. And this is something that I practice. I can't say I always do it. I say that it's a an ideal goal of mine and it's something that I try to be conscious about. And that is when I walk into a room or when I meet any person, I look at it as a shkacha pratis. And before I have an exchange, I immediately arm myself with the thought of, what can I learn from you? I'm meeting you. What can I learn from you? What does Hashem want me to learn from you? And through this thought, it allows me to stay humble. It allows me to stay open. And it allows the other person to feel that they're not being judged or scrutinized. And I feel comfortable because I'm in an open space instead of me trying to put my quote-unquote best foot forward. This has helped me a lot when I remember to do it. Now, that's one thing I wanted to share. Another thing I wanted to share also is that many times once I do learn something from them, then Hashem gives me the opportunity to then share something. Because a lot of people, we are supposed to teach them, yet they will only be open after they teach us. So it's been a very lucrative form of learning and teaching um, in, a, in a pleasant setting. So this is um, a tool I use if I walk into a crowd of people that I don't know or I, am, uh, I, or I sit down by a table and I have no idea why I'm there. Um, I had an interesting story that happened where I was seated amongst a group of Israeli women and my Hebrew is pretty uh, elementary, you can say, and all my friends were on a different table and I was wondering why am I sitting here? They're all chattering to each other and they're all part of a family simcha, and they're all family, and I'm not. And I'm thinking, what am I doing here? So the, there was a part of me that kept looking to see where I could find a seat on another table. And then I said, okay, this is where you are, Sashkacha Pratis, this is where you're supposed to be, and there's something you're going to, you have a purpose here. And as soon as you're open to this purpose, I'm sure you're going to find out what it is. So I stopped trying to find myself another place, and I accepted that I was there for a reason, whether to learn or whether to teach or both. And then within a very short time, I don't remember how it started because Baruch Hashem, as soon as you're open, things just start. And I ended up having a phenomenal conversation with one of the women there, and they ended up um, actually translating what I was saying to the entire table. So Baruch Hashem, I was able to teach some chassidus to the entire table. And, of course, I learned some things from them too. And that was Bar Hashem after I stopped feeling like I was stuck or I felt like on the defensive or et cetera, et cetera, when I was open. So that's, that's a couple of uh, tools and tips about crowds or places where we might feel uncomfortable. And I'd like to share one quick thing of what I do when I have a situation that is extremely challenging with someone that I know, especially if it's been going on for a while. Uh, this is a tool I've shared with many people, and it's a tool that's one of my favorite tools, and that is to say the Rebona Shalalam of the Kriya Shema at bedtime. There's a bedtime Shema, and there's a paragraph before that. And a lot of people say it. They don't realize the power of it. Because as Miriam was saying, that we all affect each other, and every time we strengthen anything in our relationships, we actually elevate the entire world around us. Every single person gets affected because we're all one, really. So the same thing when we say this 
prayer, even if it's someone that we don't really know so well, and especially when the situation does not make any logical sense why someone would be behaving like this to us, and we say these words, we burn the um and we ask God, and we thank God for helping us be able to forgive, or even if we can't forgive yet, at least we ask Hashem to help us release this person from having to continue to hurt us, or for us hurting them, or the situation to continue having happening the way it's happening it is absolutely amazing what happens because not only do we release the tension between ourselves at this stage of the game we're actually retroactively affecting all times and places that we might have hurt each other affected each other or places that needed closure from the beginning of time when the first time our souls met in a different reincarnation different incarnation and many times the whole reason why we experience a negative experience between two people, especially if we try everything in a logical, practical way and we cannot seem to make uh, the situation become more improved, chances are it's because it's a past lifetime thing that needs closure. And as soon as we recognize that and expose that, it can finally be healed. And the place to do it is by this very beautiful sila at the beginning of Krishma Alamita, and the words, if we say it in Hebrew, but we look at the English words and we focus on each of those words, specifically, ben ben whether in this incarnation or another reincarnation, and no person should be hurt or punished because of me. In other words, we all affect each other. And this person is suffering because as soon as, because Hashem, basically, if there's somebody who gets harmed because of someone else, that person has to ask forgiveness, otherwise, they themselves will not have such a great judgment passed on them from Hashem. So we don't want to be the cause of someone else's harm either. So the fact is that when we say this fila every single night with the intention that any relationship that we had during the day that was positive, that we want strengthened, and any relationship that felt like a pebble was thrown at us, that we want that to be healed. And anything that felt like a stone was thrown at us, that we want that to be healed. And anything that felt like it was a heavy, great rock on our shoulders, we want that closure and that healing and that release. When we have that in mind, we are actually able to create open, open channels of new relationships between the people that have been the most challenging to us. They actually be, can become our greatest friends. They actually can, it, it can become the most closest relationship. This happened with my child. It happened with myself. It happened with many people that I know. The person that was challenging and pushing us, uh, pushing our buttons the most, ended up becoming the one that was a source of great love and support and beautiful relationship when this whole thing was switched around after the forgiveness took place. So this is one very powerful tool, and there are others as well um, that I can share them with Miriam, and Miriam can share them with you, or um, I it's can amazing. share with you. I was hoping to what? share. Can I share something? Yes, for sure. sure. Hi. Yeah. yeah, this is... This is um, I, I want to say thank you for having the Fabring, and I think probably some people recognize my voice, so I was going to try to be anonymous, but I don't know if I could do that because I think so many people might recognize my voice. Um, but I am um, Gaia's mother, and I just wanted to share something that I learned with Rabbi Friedman, actually, um, years ago at a base Hana retreat in Sedona, Arizona. <clears throat> And that is that I realized um, after 42 days, because my daughter, this has been, we're going on now the 43rd day, um, that she's been in this situation, trying to keep time as well at six and a half years old, and her mother taken away from her, and just um, everything that's happened, I realized that uh, I remember something Rabbi Friedman taught me. This is after 42 days of, of intense teshuva and and crying and and praying and praying for all the children that this has ever happened to and and intense intense soul searching. I finally realized um, what Rabbi Friedman taught me, and that is I believe it's from the Tanya. I don't know where exactly. It's from, but he said that anything, any emotion that we experience. Um, Hashem experiences on a level that's infinite. Mm -hmm. So I finally realized, you know, oh my goodness, I, for the past 44 days of, of 
you know, sobbing every single day and crying every single day and, 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 and um, Tehillim and Tshuva and all these things. And I only got a mere fraction of a sliver of a tiny, 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 tiny experience of what Hashem experiences every single day that the Yidden are in Gullis and um, it was just a powerful epiphany for me. And then I said, I said to myself and I said to Hashem, and we should all say to Hashem, I am a human being and I can't do anything about this Gullis that my daughter is in. But you are Hashem and with one word, with one utterance, you could take your entire people out of Gullis and you could send Mashiach immediately. And I, that's what I want to pray for. And I hope everyone else will too. And it should never, ever happen to anyone's child. And um, I just want to thank you for having the Fabrang in, in the first place. And um, I learned a lot from all the speakers. Or from I, I came on a little bit late, and I plan to listen to it again later in the recording. Um, but thank you so much. I'm sorry I'm getting <laughs> upset. No, um, but um, I appreciate also all the, the help and support that I have had from all the shluchim down here and from um, from the Kaplan family and from um, the Halevi family and Aliza al Kayam and anyone who is supportive of me and, and what I'm trying, you know, how I'm trying to get my children back because in America it's so different here where, you know, showing... Um, you know, a non-Jewish video to a child is not really illegal. You know, it's not, it's like, it's, it's like the Friedrich Rebbe said once that America is, can be even more dangerous than Russia, where everything was gavura, everything was clear cut. You know, yes, that they were cruel to the Yidden, but it was very gavuradic. And in that sense, it was almost, almost better than what, what we're seeing happen to Jewish souls in America right now with secular education and with, with all of these temptations, and, and it's completely legal to, you know, to give someone a Goyesha video, and to, so so most people are not very sensitive to a kind of a situation like this where you would hear with a Jewish child who's, who's with non-Jewish relatives. So I really want to thank anyone who supported me, and Amir Tashem, we should see the immediate and complete redemption of every single Jew. Hashem should take us all out of Gullis completely and immediately. Amen. And if anybody wants to give Saka and direct it to my organization and get a tax-deductible donation, and I will direct 100% of that fund to you, um, my address is 640 Eastern Parkway, Unit 4C, uh, Brooklyn, New York, 11213 or you can give it to me either at 770 or at other locations, since we have many groups merged here um, in Great Neck or in Borough Park, where I teach. And I bless you that we should be celebrating very soon, like... Amen. Thank you for sharing that. And Miriam? Yes. May we finish with a niggin? Yes, absolutely. So let's 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 finish off with a very victorious niggin and I would invite everyone or Miriam, you can invite everyone, we can both invite everyone to visualize um, Galia Sara Bas, what's her mother's name? Hanna Rivka. Hanna Rivka. Um, visualizing Galia Sara Bas, Hanna Rivka back in her mother's arms and watching a Rebbe video. Even if we don't know what she looks like, we can just envision that possibility um, and thank Hashem for that while we're singing the Niggin. That's a perfect combination. Okay. Um, do we want to sing the? How about either we could sing the um, some Chastar Nigan because that's the ultimate unity Nigan, or we could sing the Napoleon's March because that's a very victorious Nigan. Which one would you let's like? Or Dida Nasa? And let's do Dida Nasa because it was just Dida Nasa. 
We could do yeah. three, and we'll have like disclaimers of Am Yisrael, Torah, and Hashem one. Sounds perfect. Okay, so sh- let's start with the uh, with the Simchas Torah again. Okay. Okay. Ah yeah 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 I did it I yeah I did it I yeah 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 And then we should go from there to the victorious niggin to oh. Napoleon's march, or should we do Napoleon's yes. march yes. and Dita Nasa? Oh, um, I, I'm sorry, I got a text and I was asked from one of the uh, uh, listeners that um, that we should especially um, try to go um, to the next level in our sneers in the merit. Uh, also, of this for this child to come back, please done, and uh, of course all mitzvahs, but especially Tznias. They texted me. Okay, Tznias also has to do with our thought and our speech as well, and of course clothing. Clothing is the outer right. area of Tznias. I think also Tznias has to do a lot with Hatznei Alachas and Masham You know, that's yeah. also in the areas where no one sees. Um, you know, maybe we should maybe we should be more specific in an area where it's really just between us and Hashem, um, or in one. our thought or in our speech. <laughs> of, of course, clothing as well. Um, the, just a suggestion. Yes, we have a clothing. mixed crowd on this line, so that's why um, all we want to we want to make suggestions. Yes. yes. Definitely all three. Right. Yes. Yeah. So suggestion would be, um, actually, sneeze has to do with spiritual sensitivity. So um, either we can be more sensitive to the words we use, to our thoughts, um, or or an area of any of the mitzvot where, um, you know, even in kashrut, you know, where it's just between us and Hashem. Hashem knows, um, you know, the level of kashrut that we have in our kitchen. Um, or where there there is a judgment call, whether to ask a rav or not, things like that. That also can be very effective as well. I just okay. missed part of that. Can can you repeat it? Um, Miriam, would you like to repeat it? Sorry, the phone cut out. Right. Be best, yeah, it would be best for you to repeat it. Okay, so Miriam had gotten a text saying that. 
Um, we should be specific in our strengthening our sneers, our sneers, um, you know, in merit of this little girl coming back. And sneers, um is absolutely one of the key foundations of the Jewish home. At the same time, we do have a mixed crowd, and we have different people at different levels. So I was, I was suggesting some specific <laughs> and, and different ideas. And one of them was to understand that sneers is not only in clothing, it's also in thought and in speech and in action, and it's basically to be sneers with Hashem, which means that at any place where it would not be something that wouldn't be known to the public, rather just between Hashem and the person, that's where the area of sneers can be addressed as well. So um, it's area of thought, of speech, um, in the area of kashrut, in the kitchen, or um, making a judgment call, um, or if we have to ask a rubber, we shouldn't. And again, it's the sneers is the idea of being discreet. It's also the idea of where there is discreetness uh, in making sure that we have that good discretion with Hashem and making those choices. Um, and spiritual sensitivity is a very key factor in a person's level of sneers. So each person needs to assess where they can strengthen themselves through spiritual sensitivity and through that their thought, speech, and action, including their clothes, can then reflect that modesty. Amen. Okay. Um, let's sing the next niggin. What's the next niggin? Should we sing Dida Nasach or should we sing a Napoleon's March? Maybe we'll do the Dida Nasach at the end because the uh, Napoleon March was a Goisha one that got converted. So hopefully, I'm going to have the kavana that the Goisha courts and the Goisha parents will like really be converted into you know releasing and not trying to take this child out of the uh, home of their Jewish parents. Amen. Okay. So I would like to also suggest that anybody who has any possibility of being able to spread the seven no chide laws, that that would be a good thing to do in the merit as well, because it seems like it's the guyish, um, a guyish oh, side that my God. challenge. Yes, so I we just want recently... To- Wrote something. Anyone want it? 770 at gmail.com. It'll help even ourselves connect to the seven North Side laws because there are our mitzvot as well. So mm-hmm. if you can, um, it's 770 same, S A N E at gmail.com. I can't wait for you to read it and give me feedback because we're going to work on getting it out to be a pamphlet soon. So I want as much feedback as possible before we go to print. Yeah, could you could you text us oh. that that website or repeat it again slowly? My website is seven seventy sane. It's not a website. This is my personal email, and I can personally email it to you. It's going seven seventy sane. Yeah, at gmail dot com. Okay. And it actually has and every oh gosh, I it actually has meditations for the goyim that they can oh, do wow. practically oh, wow. every day. It, like, goes into every specific seven off side law and what they could do to, like, understand each law in a practical way that day with a meditation. Okay, how do you spell the sane? Uh, S-A-N-E. Sane, okay. And 770 is numbers? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. I can't wait. <laughs> Okay, so this is also a very powerful action that we can take. I'm so glad okay. you mentioned it. Okay. Well, it's it's more than mention. Um, you know, every time we have a situation, we need to look at what could be the core of what we can do. You know, it's very interesting. I was at the Ohel recently, and the Rebbe was like, I can't understand. Moshe's law from Hashem was we must teach the Goyim the seven Noachite laws, and we have mm. to 
consider it halacha. You know, like, mm-hmm. this is, Rambam talks about it. It's like it's part of the Torah. And we have to do it. You know, and why aren't we doing it more, basically? You, it's um, so interesting. I, I actually have had three experiences at the OL with the same, one one was that the Rebbe was saying that we need to talk to our Jewish, to our neighbors. So Crown Heights has many of those neighbors. And the second time was that Jewish leaders and non-Jewish leaders should be teaching them. And the third time I came, the Rebbe was talking about doing 71 new establishments. And I was thinking, 71, okay, yes, yes, this is what, you know, the message, no problem. And then right afterwards, I understood it's 70 establishments, it's 70 nations, and one establishment is the Jews. Right. So that we need to strengthen everyone. And I have, I, I actually, you're, you're encouraging me to actually, maybe I'll do this in the merit of this little girl. I have at least three or four big, miraculous, um, seven Noahide lost stories of different stories that happened to me through seven Noah happened to these people and to myself through the seven Noahide laws and how I actually coached a couple of people in this with the seven Noahide laws and saw amazing results. Wow. Mm-hmm. Maybe you'll share one of them now. I don't know if how, whoever's uh, here to. Um, I don't know how much. I mean, it's, um, you know, let's take a census if people want to hear because it, it it's, I have a really interesting one that I would share. So share it. It's on recording. It's gonna hopefully a lot of people will hear this. Okay. This eventually does get on tour any time on the women's section, by the way. Well, really? I, yes. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, this is with my cleaning lady. Um, the story goes very quickly that this clean lady was um, someone who had been a clean lady for me for seven years, and then she left because she was having a child. And then the next three years, um, I kept having different people the whole time, and every time I would have a clean lady, I would share the seven no hide laws, and then very soon after that, within like a week or two, they would tell me they had to leave. And this happened quite a few times. And meanwhile, I didn't like any of them really the way they were cleaning anyway, so it didn't bother me so much. But it was an interesting phenomenon that I was watching. Meanwhile, I was praying that I would have my other clean lady back, and I tried to reach her. She had told me that three years later I'd be able to have her again because her child would be three and she could come work again. And I tried to get hold of her, and the phone numbers were obsolete at that point. And so it was, I did not know how to reach her, and I would visualize her coming, and I would say, Hashem, if she's going to be back with me, I'm telling you this is going to be a biggest miracle. So I'm visualizing her coming, but meanwhile, I have no way of getting hold of her, and um, I'm going through all these clean ladies, and then it reaches a point where I'm saying, you know what, um, it's time for me to have one that's permanent. I can't just keep having a new one. I'm going to get one. I was going to take the one from 770, and I arranged for her to come on Thursday so that she would be able to, I would train her for Friday, and she would come three hours before Shabbos because I was going to honor Shabbos properly three hours of a clean lady every Friday. So that Wednesday night, I spoke to her. She gave me a different number to call her Thursday. She wouldn't have the other number. I called her Thursday morning. The number is the wrong number. Now I don't have her again. Meanwhile, there's somebody who had given me that number, knocks on my door, and I thought that this was, um, my friends would give me the number, and when I ask who it is, I hear the name of my clean lady at the door saying, Rosio. I could not believe it. I opened up the door. I said, oh, my goodness. She goes, Miss, I know we haven't seen each other for so long. I figured I was going to try to come by. It had taken her. She had tried for one month to get hold of me, and she couldn't get hold of me because the only number she had was the number that we were no longer using. So she had tried to get hold of my number. She couldn't get hold of me. And the day that I decided that I was going to honor Shabbos for three hours every single week with a permanent, so to speak, clean lady, she showed up. I was beyond, I was amazed. Of course, not only did I not, not only did I have it just for three hours, I was able to have this clean lady now for as much time as I wanted. I ended up having her um, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, the hours that I wanted. Wow. And here's my test. If I'm going to tell her the Sheva Mitzvah, it's the seven Nochad laws, did Hashem send her back to me so that she could disappear? Because remember, every time I shared it, they disappeared. And I didn't know what to do. And I was, um, hello? 
Yeah. Hello. Here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Here. Sorry. And I, I did not know what to do. I really grappled with my inner side. What's inside me? What should I do? Should I tell her? Should I not? If I'm going to tell her and she's going to leave, that's going to be such a tease for me. But at the same time, I have to do the right thing. And I finally decided it's a shkacha pratis and I'm going to surrender to Hashem, whatever he wants, I'm going to accept it. So I told her the seven Noahide laws and she didn't leave. Mm-hmm. And not only did she not leave, but here's what happened. After I told her the Noahide laws, I was, um, it was like, you know, that was Wednesday. And Friday I was making challah. It was the morning. I was making challah in the morning. And I was kneading my dough. And I was telling her, I, I always used to share with her things because I, I believe in telling everyone about God. Of course, that's what Hashem and the Rebbe want. So I was telling her that when I make this dough, I, I thank God and I ask God for all the blessings for my family and for the world. And I was telling her what they mean in a very basic language. And she says to me, I, Miss, I really need blessings. I said, you do? And then there was a light bulb that popped in my head. And I said, I'm going to get, we're going to work on, um, I'm going to do a coaching with her. There's a certain coaching that I do, which is the forgiveness coaching. I worked with, I spoke to you about the forgiveness. So it's a forgiveness coaching. That's how I could say it in short. And I, I'm going to do this with her with the seven no high laws. Now her history was when she came to me seven years ago, she used to come with a black and blue eye or, a, or, or a, a bruise on her arm. Her husband was a drunkard, and he used to beat her. And she was a very, very special, sincere woman. And she wasn't very, like, she didn't ask for a lot, and she didn't think of herself very highly. And by the time she, she left, she had gone to one of these um, anonymous groups, and he had stopped beating her, but he was still continuing to drink. And this was the man that she had a baby with. And when she came to me now, three years later, he was still drinking, and there, there were, needless to say, there was no shalom bias, but at least he wasn't hurting her physically. And they were now arguing constantly about their daughter, who was three years old, the way to educate her. The child was whining and crying a whole day. They lived in a cramped, tiny apartment with a bunch of other Spanish relatives. And one of them was another drinker, so they were drinking together and fighting, and there was yelling. It was a very un in short, situation. By the time I finished working with her and coaching her in the Shava Mitzvah, she had Shalom bias. Her son, who used to, to um, play hurt animals for fun, stopped doing that. Her daughter became a happy-go-lucky, very delicious, lovable child, they changed schools for this child. They moved to their own apartment. <laughs> they stopped living with all these other family members that were bringing more negative energy. The husband had stopped drinking 80% of the time. Mm-hmm. A mother-in-law of hers that was really um, not doing well and was in the hospital was released from the hospital feeling better. And the biggest miracle that happened was one day she fell on the, by the subway, she hurt her arm. And she calls me up and says, Mrs., I know come to work tomorrow. I said, what do you mean I need your help? She says, I go to a hospital. I have an arm, it hurts, you know, whatever. And I said to her, um, we're going to try something. It's going to be a, an experiment. I can't tell you it's going to work, but let's try. Are you willing to try to do some coaching on the seven Noahide laws? And she says, yes. And we did some coaching for 20 minutes on the phone. And by the 20 minute, the time the 20 minutes were up, she says, okay, Mrs., I come to you tomorrow. My arm feels better. It was wow. amazing the miracles that took place. There were two things wow. that happened. Very interesting to note. I taught her the first five, and I did the coaching with her on the first five without introducing her specifically to the Rebbe. I just taught it to her. Um, I, taught, I showed her that the Rebbe had taught it to us, but I didn't elicit the Rebbe's help yet. I basically, like, it wasn't in the merit of the Rebbe yet. It was just that we were, we were focusing straight on with God. And then the last two, which are the most um, powerful and, and the biggest um, of the opposite of Kedusha, which is the unforbidden relations and the idolatry, those two, um, we elicited the Rebbe's help with that. And we saw miracles. And mm-hmm. now, as, as some of you know, I moved from New York to Kingston, Pennsylvania, so I no longer have her 
as my cleaning lady, before we left, a few weeks before we left, the biggest miracle took place because there was 20%. Remember, it was 80%. He had stopped the alcohol story, the alcoholic drinking, but then he started up again. And I told her, we need to strengthen the seven Ochai laws in this area. And she said, yes. And she started again. And when she did, she did it with such fervor that his company gave him an ultimatum and said, either you stop drinking completely or you're out of a job. And they gave him a two-week probation where he couldn't come to work and he had to work through his alcoholism that he couldn't drink. And then wow. only when he was ready to stop drinking completely, after two weeks was he able to come back. And as we speak, from when I, from that point on until we left, and I assume until now, he no longer drinks. And she feels that this is 100% the coaching that we did through the seven Noachai laws. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Oh, Beautiful. wow. This inspires me to really go and get these out there faster. And to share, because when you can share the miracle stories with, with the people you're doing the soyam with. Definitely. Yes, yes, yes. I, I have two other fascinating stories which I'm going to write down, and I will allow Miriam to send it to everyone. I wanted to just touch on the SNEAS again because I, I know that you said, you know, we have a mixed crowd. Right now there's only three people on the line, three or four people. So maybe other people will hear in the future. But I did want to point out that we just learned in Tanya, if you follow the Tanya every day, just a few days ago, we learned that the thought, speech, and deed are actually even higher than the soul. So it is, you know, yes, SNEAS has several components, but really how we dress can really affect and impact our soul. So, and I think it can be a very, very touchy subject because the Rebbe says that Sneas is associated with um, kavod, or the way we dress, our clothing, our physical clothing, it's associated with kavod. So how dare you ever say anything to anyone about how they're dressed? But I think that it's important to um, break the ice and to start having groups where people are learning about Sneas or even talking about it and how it affects them and how it affects their lives. And also, and even if you just learn the halachas, the halachas are the, are the four, it's the apartment. Somebody told me once a beautiful saying that Hashem has, um, a, he has a palace upstairs, but he wants an apartment down here. And that's the halachas, the four walls. So once you start to learn just the halachas, it kind of um, takes away the, the subjective emotional, you know, pull that we have on it. And um, so I just thought I would just start with one interesting halacha that I learned that I never be- knew before, that the A-line skirts, um, the, the skirts that start out wide at the top and become narrow at towards the knees are technically not halakhically, you know, okay. Does anyone else have a halakha on Tzniyas they'd like to share in the merit of Galia Sarabas Khan Rivka? Um, Khan Rivka, I, yeah. like um, I would like to just, just a detail, um, it's interesting you call it A-line skirts. Um, most of us understand A-line skirts as starting off narrow and ending wide. So these would probably be called pencil skirts that you're referring to? Yeah, I think so. Well, but the pencil yeah. skirts are tricky. Some of them come more in where you mommish, like almost squeezing your legs. And some pencil skirts aren't going inward towards. Right. Exactly. Towards it's a little different. But a line, but a lines are. If you look at the the shape of an A, is that it's 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 a narrow on top and then it widens on the bottom. That's what they call a line. So a lines are actually probably very sneeze. But right. what you're talking about are the ones I would call them. I know that one type of skirt that that I really in the course of Dalia Sarabas. What's your name? Hana what? Hana Rivka. Hana Rivka. Hana Rivka. Hana Rivka. Uh huh. Um, and this plus ever, I would like to say this even for three people, but it's going to be heard by whoever. And if yes. even one person understands this, it's important. The bandage skirts and hmm. the and those those tight skirts that are like the material is completely revealing, uh-huh. and the elastic shockingly, the like shockingly, 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 shockingly. Yeah, the, the, yeah. Uh, this, this is this, this. For me, I was honestly very shocked that this is something. You know that I actually once said something to one of the stores. I said something like, you know, I, I just want to, you know, I would like to point out, if you don't mind, I said something like, is it possible that when um, a 
a Jewish or a from person walks into the store, that maybe the the there maybe can be different sections, you know, yeah. when they when they come, like direct them, you know, this is not the section for you to look at. Here's the section for you to look at. Mm-hmm. I was like trying to like encourage them to, because they were saying, no, we have to have for all customers and all clientele, and we have a lot of non-Jewish clientele, so we can't just carry Tzniya's clothes. So mm-hmm. I said, mm-hmm. so then somehow, you know, depart, like departmentalize them or something and they're right. saying no because there's a lot of people who want to come and they'll, they'll get offended. What do you mean? Why are you telling me to go to this section, not this section? <laughs> I know. I'm and go for it. You know, that, 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 um, that, the, that the store owners as well should be very, you know, even if we could give a bracha to, to, to either someone to open up a store or for one of the store owners to be really strong in the fact that, okay, we are going to only carry – a certain line of clothing, a certain type of clothing, and we're going to basically, you know, stand up against the height. Uh, By the way, on height that try to do this, and in the beginning they were they were saying this is what they were going to do, and I, you know, I saw I saw that this was their intention in the beginning, and I even wanted to shop there, and I brought my daughter there. Unfortunately, I see that, um, you know, that hasn't necessarily continued that way, and. There are a lot, a lot of the the stuff that they carry. We need to give them a bracha that it should really reflect what their original intention was. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Um, well, another halacha. I I would like to share something interesting that it's it's not a halacha, but it's it's the halacha and then the the beauty of that halacha. So the halacha is that our neckline needs to be covered. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yes, the collarbone. Yes, the collarbone. Yes, explain, the collarbone. Explain what the neckline needs. Um, the collarbone, that, that, that is the circumference from the bone all the way around needs to be covered. Yeah. And, and yeah. I would like to hear from you. Yes. There's one way of explaining it was easy. When you put on a necklace, the way the necklace lays on your neck, that's the way it can be up to where it has to be covered over. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I've seen this in some of the books that they explain it that way. Okay, okay. So I want to share something with you that um, there's a there are points in the body that correspond to the different words of of MS Vyatsev and Nacham Vakayim Vyashar etc. and and the word that corresponds to the neckline to the collarbone is the naira. And the naira has to do with Yerushalayim. And Yerushalayim is to our relationship with a husband or, in general, a male relationship. So, um, wow. again, I, I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm not looking to, God forbid, um, you know, I don't want to offend anyone because I know that everyone has a different situation. But, I, again, this is for those who might listen at a later date. I have a friend of mine who I was trying to encourage to strengthen um, her her collarbone coverage, and uh-huh. I just mentioned something to the point of, you know, that when I am more careful with that, I try to be very careful with that, and I see a difference in my relationship with my husband because wow. it's almost like I'm being extra careful in the Nora and the Yer Shemayim, and that affects my relationship with my husband. And this friend of mine heard me but didn't really, you know, she heard. I don't know what she heard or she didn't. And I, and I just, I said it in a very casual way and then we left it. And a couple of days later, she actually called me and she said, oh my goodness, you're so right. Today I decided I'm going to try this. Let me try it and see what happens. And when I did, I was extra careful with my collarbone. Today we had such a good communication and I felt a closeness to my husband I never felt before. Wow. Wow. What were the other... Um... I, the other words that you said that they correspond to the parts of the body to cover? Well, basically the way it works is that there's a one, there's a line from the top of our head, from our kesser, mm-hmm. all the way down to the to the bottom of our body. And it goes, so it goes, every um, every word of the yasif goes with a different one. So the yasif, the top one would be on the top of the head. The yasif, the nachon would be, at the hairline. Viyatsed. Hold on, hold on. I'm, I'm writing it down as you say it. So Viyatsed. Viyatsev, right? Viyatsev is the top. 
Yeah, see. This, by the way, okay. is from Kabbalah. This okay. is from Kabbalah, and I learned it from Rabbi Ginsburg's book. Its sources of Kabbalah. Its source is in a in a book of Kabbalah. Do you know the name of the Rabbi Ginsburg book? Yes, it's called. Uh, give me a second. Was it called? It was in the body, mind, mind and soul. Body, mind, and soul. Body, mind, okay. body, mind and soul. Okay. Thank you so much. So the Yatsev was the top. Right. And mm-hmm. yeah, Nachan, Nachan is the hairline. Uh huh. The Kayam is the forehead, the middle of the forehead. Mm hmm. Yeah, the Nachan, the Kayam. The Yashar is the uh, between the two eyebrows the naman is the tip of the nose the ahuv is the um by the lip by the upper lip by the by the what's it called the the place where the malach flicks us i forgot the name of yeah. it yeah yeah okay so, so this yeah. goes all the way down the entire body yes the yasha bin okay. the okay. you don't have to i'll try the to chaviv, find a book the chaviv is the t- tip of the tongue Mhm. The Nachmad is the tip of the chin. The Naim is the middle. It's the, like the Adam's apple. The Nora is the collarbone. The Adir is in between the two breasts, by the, I guess, in the middle of the sternum. Um, no, not sternum. I don't know what it's called. Maybe, maybe it is called that. I don't know. Um, I did. A masukan is on the bottom of the breastbone, like under the rib cage. And umakubal and vitoviyafe are three points: one below the belly button, one by the belly button, one below the belly button, and the one lowest at the edge at the edge edge of the body. And mm-hmm. that and actually each group of three is connected to a different image of Hashem. It's very, mm. very fascinating. Wow. Wow. I've got to get that book. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing. That book is awesome. Unreal. So many speakers. Called to have Body and Mind? Oh, my gosh. Yes. I used to do a lot of healing to it, but and now, thank, thank God, um, I've, I've upped the healing to a new level, which, um, I mean, I could, there's so much there's so much to share, but perhaps if you wanted to do a private for bringing in, I would be happy mm-hmm. to share some more things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's a shame. That's a shame. Okay. Um, I think let's finish with a niggin, uh, because it is getting late, and I'm sure that the people that will be listening will also have a certain amount of time they can listen. <laughs> Are we still being recorded? Yes. Okay. I think this has been two hours and 41 minutes. It's been, um, uh, wow. Dula. Mm-hmm. It's the, it's, it's the beginning of Gula because the real Gula is when she's reunited with her daughter. Um, Amen. And whenever Yid is reunited with Hashem and Mashiach, the Rebbe. Yes. Yes, exactly, exactly. Because, like I said, that's what I learned from all of this. That I just wow. have a tiny, tiny, tiny little taste of what Hashem goes through every single day. Yes, Chana Rachel. I was actually just sharing that with somebody today. How um, how Hashem is that? I was sharing that the person was um, uh, sharing something that was really, um, you know, they were really feeling pained by something, mm-hmm. and they were feeling like. You know, where can they direct their pain and their frustration to? And then they were thinking, I don't want to direct it back to Hashem because 
Hashem is so good to me. He does so, so much good. Well, how can I how can I direct that pain towards him? But I have no one else to direct the pain towards, and I'm not, I can't feel guilty about this because I feel like there were circumstances that didn't allow me to make you know to to have it better any and any differently, etc. Mm-hmm. And then I shared that with that, her. I shared that with them, and I said, Do you know that whatever pain you're feeling right now, Hashem is with us in that pain. So. Um, Instead of feeling anger or frustration towards him, we can feel not only compassion um, because Hashem is with us. Hashem is with us in this pain. Hashem is experiencing the same pain with us. Hashem is mm-hmm. in that gulf with us. Hashem is also captured. So mm-hmm. Hashem knows what that feels like, and he's feeling and experiencing it with us. That's mm-hmm. what the Shekhinah went with us. At the same time, what we need to re- remember two things. Number one, the Rebbe and Sichas has said that we're not in Gullus anymore. We are in a stage of Geula, which means that we are, in the, we, we are at the threshold of the final Geula. And for the meantime, right now, what we need to recognize is that every single thing we're going through in our life is actually a, another step to getting to the final Geula. And... Um, that right now, the Rebbe actually has a very powerful sikha, um that he explains that if Hashem tells us to do something, he does it himself. So mm-hmm. that, and this sikha is Parshas Kisete uh, Kisavai from from the sikha, from the latest sikha, um, known Aleph. And the Rebbe says that if we have the, uh, the, um, the law that we have to pay a worker, a day worker, his wages before, as soon as he finishes his work, then that means that Hashem would have to pay us also, because we mm-hmm. are also considered his workers. That's mm-hmm. what it says in Turkey Yavis for his workers. So then we have to be paid. So one second, we're supposed to pay them right at the end of their work, and here we've worked for so many, 2,000 years, and we haven't been paid. So it must be that we are being paid. And let's see what Hashem's payment system is like. Hashem's payment system is schar of the mitzvah is a mitzvah. Schar, the reward of a mitzvah, is a mitzvah. So every time we do a mitzvah, our repayment, our payment, our reward is a mitzvah. So mm-hmm. we are being paid and we're constantly being paid. Which means that when we find ourselves in a situation or a challenge, what we need to say to Hashem at that moment is, okay, Hashem, this is obviously my payment, and if it's my payment, then it's the mitzvah. There's an opportunity for a big mitzvah here, so I'm open. Thank you, Hashem, for showing me what mitzvah can I do right now. And sometimes the mitzvah is hashkach to to have um, be down the kafros, and sometimes the mitzvah is to strengthen our muna, and sometimes the mitzvah is to glorify Hashem, and sometimes the mitzvah is the opportunity for many more people to see Hashem than just um, the people uh, than than than, be, than previously. And Wait a second, though, Nachamadina, haven't you heard what the Chafetzayim said about that and the Geula? We have to demand payment that Hashem send Mashiach and Geula immediately. And when we enough people ask Him, demanding it, then Hashem will send it. I mean, that's a very nice. I appreciate that you're sharing that, but like. You also have to demand that he send Mashiach and Gula immediately. The same way that yes, a day worker says, Hashem doesn't have to send Mashiach if we don't demand him. The same way a day worker well, doesn't have to get paid unless he didn't get paid. Okay. Well, here you see this is this is a much longer conversation than one on his phone. Um, we're we're focusing, you know, when the Chavetz Chaim was talking, the, the Chavetz Chaim was talking pre Mashiach era. Okay. At this point, we're in Mashiach era because we have been given a very clear directive that Mashiach himself and Mashiach itself is here. What's the idea of Mashiach? Seeing Hashem everywhere, having Ashkacha practice, seeing how all the nations have recognized Hashem. We live in a time where we're not under Russian rule, where we're being beaten for learning Torah and Mitzvah. We live in a time where we can have open Judaism and open Yiddishkeit, and we have droves of people learning about Hashem. That's Mashiach. And we know, um, you see, again, I don't know where you're coming from as far as who Mashiach is, 
and that's for a whole different topic. We're talking about Geula Amitis Ashlema. I have a friend of mine um, whose mother passed away recently, and she came to her in a dream, and this woman said to her mother, please ask Hashem to bring Mashiach now. And her mother's response was, Geula. And she said, Mashiach. And her mother's response was, Geula. So, interestingly, this is from someone who is above the realm of the body and sees what's real, what's MS. So the fact is, what we're aiming for now is Geula. But we're not only aiming for Geula because we have an opportunity to bring Geula into our lives every single day by bringing the Aleph into the Gaila, as I explained earlier. <laughs> what we're looking for is the Geula Amitis Vashlema, which goes back to the Chafetz Chaim. The Rebbe says, if enough people are going to experience their personal Geula, their personal redemption, then they will affect all of the people around them to experience their personal redemption. And from there, that will spread and spread until the majority of the people will experience their personal redemption and then the entire world will have redemption. Mm -hmm. And not only Mm -hmm. that, but we're actually at a time where we were talking about, um, Miriam was talking about from Heichaltzu, about the sparks that fell and they shattered and they're in every person and they're all over the world, etc. Actually, the Rebbe teaches us that we already have the vessels. The vessels have already been fixed by all of our work and effort and pain and suffering for the past 2,000 years. We have actually put together the vessels. Now we just need the light because when there was the shattering, the lights had vessels, but the vessels were not able to contain them. It was like trying to take um, the the Niagara Falls of Canada and pour it into a bathtub or into a pitcher. Like it was the 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 vessel wasn't big enough to expand and it was not strong enough to hold on to so much light, to so much water, so to speak. So those vessels, we have repaired them by all the work we've done, by all the pain and the suffering and the torture that we've gone through for two thousand years. We've repaired those vessels. We now have just the light. That needs to come down. And the light comes down with every interaction that's positive between us and another Jew and between us and Hashem. So right now, that's what we're aiming for. And when we're aiming for that, we already have the first piece. So we already have part of the geula. We already have the part that around the world, the the Jews are becoming the center of attention um, many times positively, many times we are seeing opposite, but more and more the nations are starting to realize what's the truth about the Jews and the and the truth about the other nation that's challenging us so much. And we see many, many places where um, the the nations are, are exalting and rejoicing over Hashem and over the Jews. And, um, you know, we we ourselves, I and myself have experienced that, um, I, I mean, I had an absolutely amazing story. We were on the way from King. We were on the way from Crown Heights. We I used to live in Crown Heights for 21 years, and now we moved to Kingston, Pennsylvania, um, through a bracha of the Rebbe. And we were on the way. We were driving up um, to our new home, it's temporary for this year, in Kingston, Pennsylvania. And we stopped off in a place in Pennsylvania, and I forgot the name of the place. And we're at this gas station, and it's 11-something at night. And this woman, African-American, large woman, walks over to our car. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, what does this woman want? I'm not really sure this is such a great idea, but it's a woman, and my husband was there. So she knocks on the window, and my husband rolls down the window, and she says, I just wanted to tell you. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome to, I forgot the place where it is. Welcome to wherever it is. And and we're looking at her, and she said, you know, I used to live in a place called Crown Heights on Lefferts Avenue. I haven't seen a person like you, one of those wonderful Jews, for a long time now because I moved. And I'm so glad to see you. You should know that Rebbe, that rabbi, such a wonderful man, and those people, they're so wonderful. And I just have to come over to your car and tell you 
to welcome to this place because I'm so glad and I'm so excited to see someone who looks like the people that I think are so great from wow. the life. That is so great. I love that story. Wow. And I then, wish I could have seen a video of that. Mm-hmm. It was amazing. And I'm looking at it, I'm like thinking to myself, is this Hashkacha process or what? It's absolutely mm-hmm. amazing. And it was not, it was not, my husband had stopped off for gas and it wasn't even a typical gas station. We had to go around to go to the gas station. It was just such a Hashkacha process and I forgot the place was called, but I'll remember in a minute. Anyway, I didn't have a Shava Mitzvah's card on me, but I had this other card that my friend had given me, Nechamdina Vail had given me, of someone um, that says, it's a card of something like Mashiach is coming to act, you know, I'm adding goodies and kindness. And I gave it to her. And then I found a card. I thought I didn't have one. And I found the card of a Shavu Mitzvah. It's underneath. I gave it to her and I said, well, I'm really glad that I met you too. And here's something to hold on to for your, for your great memories in Crown Heights. And here's a picture of the Rebbe. And I handed <laughs> it over to her. And she's like, so excited. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you. Thank you so much. So this is the idea of Mashiach, where mm-hmm. you have a person from random who knows where that walks up to you to tell you how excited she is to see you because you're a Jew and you remember and, and, and she remembers, you know, the Rebbe mm-hmm. and, and, and these people in Crown Heights. Mm-hmm. And so when you have this and you have another when next door to me on the other side of me, um, there's this woman, and I start talking to her about the seven Noahide laws, and she's nodding her head, and she's like, absolutely, you know, this is the way to go, and, you know, come over to me whenever, you know, you want to, so I'm waiting for my kids to go back to school, because they have vacation now, and I'm going to go over to her, and we're going to do the seven Noahide laws, and then you have, I have all these interesting, I have so many stories, I have so many people have been so open, I can't even tell you, my son, he la- he he's really funny, he actually inspires me to do the seven mitzvahs. Because now he's actually in Shiva, but then every day he would come home and he'd say, "Okay, Ma, what's your seven what's your seven Noachid law story today?" <laughs> <laughs> really funny. <laughs> anyway, so so uh, the bottom line is that this is Mashiach. Mashiach is when Umala Arthias Hashem, when the whole world sees the knowledge of Hashem, and everywhere we go, you should see the things I see on videos on, on the WhatsApps. What they WhatsApp us. You see people trying to sing all of our, you know, our, our songs about Mashiach, not even Mashiach, about, about Hashem, the knowledge being covered and all these different, um, these different beautiful um, Tehillim words that we sing about the nations coming to Hashem. The nations are singing it. The African, there's a whole, one of them, what's happened is like African American, African American choir, white suits and white things on their heads. And they're singing the entire band that they're singing all of these things. Mm. This is Mashiach. You know, this this is wow. the idea. So when we're talking, what we are really asking for, we're asking for Geula. We want to see mm. Mashiach again. We want to see our Mashiach again. That's what we want. And we want to see the final revealed redemption. And when we're able to get that understanding and understand that every time we have a challenge and we see Ashkacha Pratis, how Hashem answers us, this is one step of Gula, one step of Gula, one step of Gula. And uh, um, I think we've been speaking for a very long time, but I'd like to add, I want to finish off with a visualization for us to understand how close we really are to the final Gula. There's um, a, a little phenomena that Hashem has made that there's a one cell creature called an amoeba and there's also another one cell creature i don't know what it's called and i'm not sure if it's the amoeba or if it's another one cell creature but there is a creature that doubles itself every minute so if you take a cup and you put one inside the cup it's going to double itself every minute so by the 59th minute only half the cup is going to be filled one minute later, the entire cup is filled. We mm. work, we work, we work. We think how much, how, how much have we invested? Another level, another level. How much more? So it seems like it's so long. It seems like it's dragging out. 
we don't realize we might be by the 58th, almost 59th minute, and it's just one more minute where everyone does that one more thing, and it doubles, and we have the tipping point in Mashiach. Is revealed, and we have the final Gula Mitzvah Shleima with the base of Mikdash. Amen. Amen. Are you going to sing? Absolutely. That was amazing. Okay. Wow. Okay, let's sing Napoleon's March. What's Napoleon's March? How does it start? Um, did it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Did it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah.
shining by smiling through it all. All the best. Thank you.